Welcome everybody to our uh, Department of Marine Geosciences uh, weekly seminar series. Um, today we are happy uh, to host Professor Atle Rotevatten from the University of Bergen in Norway. Before I start to present and I present a, a Professor Rotevatten, I have been requested to uh, remind all the students to um, about the call of abstract for the ninth. Haifa Conference in Marine Sciences, uh, with a deadline approaching on the 14th of April. Okay, the conference will be held at 19th of June at the University in Safdia Auditorium. And not necessarily to say that we are, as a school, organizing this uh, event, and most all of you, we, you are required to required to opt for the option for attending. <laughs> okay, now we come to the seminar. Um, so today we are hosting Professor Atle Rotovatten from the University of Bergen in Norway. Uh, Atle Rotovatten is the head of the department starting from January 20, uh, 2022 and professor of structural geology and basin analysis at the Department of Earth Science at the University of Bergen. He is also the editor in chief of the of the international scientific journal based in research. Atle holds a, a, a master degree from the University of Oslo and a PhD from the University of Bergen. His main research interests include microstructure and the formation mechanism in porous granular rocks, the structure of evolution of holes and sedimentary basins, and the interaction of deformation, fluid flow, and diagenesis in sedimentary basins. Atle loves teaching and is engaged in, cur in curriculum development and educational strategy at various institutions levels at the University of Bergen. He has received various awards for his work, including the Roish Medal for uh, Early Career Researchers from the Norwegian Geological Society in 2011, the Olaf Thorn National Teaching Excellence Prize in 2018, and was awarded a status of excellent teaching practitioner at the University of Bergen in 2021. Atle is committed to working for uh, improved equity, diversity, and inclusion at the University of Bergen and in academia in general. As part of this, he has been strongly involved in Gender Act project at the University of Bergen, which aims to <coughs> enact change across the natural science disciplines at the university and to improve to improve gender balance and diversity overall. So with this word, we are uh, honored to host him. And today he's going to talk about the formation, fluid flow, and diagenesis in the proximity of basin bounded, bounding faults in rift basins. So actually the podium is yours. Hi, um, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I think, um, there has maybe been some miscommunication about the title may have, and that's i take that fully on me because i think i did email you and, and send you a new title but i think i i um, i prepared for the old title <laughs> so that's well, all my no, no, okay so talk, talk about the old title it's fine so i, I will i will so i'll tell you so that, but thank you for the very kind invitation uh, and for the kind introduction what i am going to talk about is Fault structure and slit localization in porous volcanic plastic rocks. Um, and um, let me just see here. I'm just going to move some of these tool lines here so I can see my screen. Yeah, apologies for that. <laughs> anyway, um, for those who came to hear about uh, rift basins, um, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll love volcanic plastic rocks anyway. Um, so, yeah, before I go to this, I'd like to you know, just acknowledge my co-authors, Thibaut Cavallés, who is an uh, associate professor at the University of Bordeaux and a long-standing collaborator and friend, and uh, two uh, former students, Martin Chienes and Hanna Yavidala, who has contributed to this work. Um, so <clears throat> this is what this looks like, these porous volcanic clastic rocks. And, um, and these, um, these rocks are, uh, full of faults and deformation bounds, which is what I am going to talk about today. Um, I can, I can, uh, I can just. Uh, I'm just trying to remember if I, if I ever wrote an abstract and sent to you. Uh, but anyway, this is what I'm talking about now. So we'll just, uh, we'll just go with that. 
Um, so volcanic clastic rocks. Um, volcanic clastic, what is that? You know, volcanic clastic refers to basically all clastic sediments composed mainly of particles of volcanic origin, regardless of how that sediment formed. So the processes responsible for volcanic clastic sedimentation ranges from the purely igneous on one hand to normal sedimentary process on the other, and with sort of complex interaction of igneous and sedimentary process in the middle. So you can imagine that in, you know, magmatic petrology, these kind of rocks are often being ignored a little bit. And also in sedimentology, they're kind of being a little bit ignored. So they kind of fall between. And the pictures here is from the 2021 Tonga eruption on the right, where you can see volcanic clastic deposition in action. Um, and over here, you can see on the left, uh, the Shitiping Tufts in, in Taiwan. Um, I'm just going to do a laser. Can you see a laser pointer now? Pointer options, laser pointer. Can you see my laser pointer now? Yes, we do. OK, good. So on the left here, you can see the Shitiping Tufts in Taiwan, which is the study area for some of the stuff that I'm going to show you today. So why study fault structure and slip localization in volcanic clastics? Well, <clears throat> volcan volcanic and volcanic clastic rocks cover more than 60% of the Earth's surface. So that's one good reason to study them. Um, and fault zones cutting volcanic and volcanic clastic rocks represent significant seismogenic sources worldwide. And here are some examples of of earthquake faults with known earthquakes that run through volcanic clastic rocks. And also fault zones in volcanics and volcanic clastics are important for transmitting and trapping fluids such as water, hydrothermal fluids, hydrocarbons, as well as for fluid rock interactions, you know, with implications for ore forming processes and, and also chemical carbon sequestration in, in basalts. So if we want to talk about fault localization in porous volcanic clastics, we, we need to take a step back and talk about deformation accommodation in porous granular rocks in general. And that knowledge has been developed, you know, pretty much in, in quartz sandstones in the Western United States, um, deformation bands, or deformation band faulting. So we'll talk about that for a few minutes. So <clears throat> porous and granular rocks are kind of special. They, um, they, have, they consist of grains and the pores around them and deformation bands sort of form by the crushing of the grains to put it very simply. Um, and here is you know, a sketch of a fault zone and the position from tip to the actual slip surface can be seen so, as sort of a proxy as well for the different stages of evolution along the fault, whereas the tip is at the very early stage we can see a more mature stage of faulting when you uh, get to the more central part of the fault zone. So also, you know, how did we become interested in this? We've, 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 uh, in, in, in deformation of volcanic clastics, we've worked in uh, with deformation bands in other rock types for many, many years. And um, for me, it started during my PhD. My PhD supervisor was Hawkwood Fossen, who is a you know, very, um, very well-known structural geologist and who's worked on deformation bands um, for a very long time. So, and also me and my students have worked on this for a long time. Here are some of the examples of places we worked in Nevada with Louisa, who did her PhD in 2015. Um, uh, this is actually Greg Ballas, who was a collaborator on the project. And also in Utah, where we've had uh, here are a couple of guys who were master students at the time. Um, they, they did their master thesis in, in 2020. This is deformation bands in Utah. And we also looked at deformation bands in carbonate rocks. So in Malta, we worked and uh, we had some students there as well. Ellen Tool, Simon Heidi Foxmark over here. So we've been interested in deformation bands for a long time. In New Zealand, we, we were looking at the effect of coal entrainment in deformation bands. Um, as you can see here, for example, there is coal entrained in the deformation band, and, and we've been looking at you know, what is the effect on the deformation and so on. And uh, Rebecca Achteswog did a master thesis on this work just last year. And Matteo de Murtas, who's also been involved in this, is currently a postdoc here. 
Um, so yeah, lots of interesting work. We've also done this in the subsurface, looking at Hakan Haganas, who's currently a PhD student, is looking at deformation bounds from the subsurface in core. And um, and also um, in Greenland, we've been working on deformation bounds in, in gravel with a bunch of former students such as uh, and postdocs such as Dr. Eric Solomon was a postdoc here and uh, uh, Heis Hanstra and Thomas Christensen, and, and we basically looked at how uh, deformation bands form in gravel. So we have a long history of being interested in deformation bands. So, you know, we, it's, it's only natural to be interested then in what happens in a different kind of material. And then I have to say here, Thibaut Kavai, Kavayes, who is, uh, you know, the co-author I mentioned, who is, has been a long-standing collaborator and friend, he, we um, did a project together on something completely different in Tunisia in 2013-14 and then he was in industry and then he subsequently left and started an academic career and he showed me some pictures from this and he said doesn't this look interesting and then we just decided yes we need to we need to go and find out what what this is you know what is going on with these deformation bands in volcanic plastics um, that very few people had worked on at the time and this is in Taiwan, basically. So we've had a, some students working here, Hanna and Martin, who are co-authors on this talk, and also Tolgek Basti. So what we found out was that some things were very different in the Taiwan structures that we looked at, the deformation bands that we looked at in Taiwan from these other deformation bands and faults that we've looked at in other types of cores and granular rocks. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, in a second, <clears throat> but um, the deformation bands in sandstone we, we we touched on briefly. I mean, this is a term deformation band. It was coined by Attila Idine, who just recently passed away. Um, he was a professor at Stanford and published his first paper on deformation bands in 1978, which has ever since been a classic. Um, deformation bands have been widely studied in the Western U.S. and, and later in other places. Um, but what characterizes deformation of porous granular materials? I mentioned that pore space and, and grains uh, characterize these materials, and that makes them kind of special. They have a different response to stress than low porous or non porous rocks, um, because stress tends to concentrate at the grain contact points, and therefore we have particulate and cataclastic flow as a deformation mechanism rather than this discrete slip. So essentially, if you look here, there is a, an, a, instead of having a discrete slip surface, you have a zone where grains can move around um, and reorganize themselves, or as over on the right here, they can experience um, stress concentration at the grain contact points and break down the grains. So, <clears throat> So that was in porous quartz sandstones, cataclastic flow, as you can see on top here. Um, what, we, what we know from porous carbonate rocks is that in addition to these particulate flow and, and granular flow, flow processes, dissolution is really important in, in, in carbonates. So all of this previous knowledge you know, motivates us to find out you know, what, how is this working in porous volcanic plastic rocks. So <clears throat> Having talked a little bit about how deformation bands form, we, I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about different models for fault formation in porous granular rocks, which also has been developed in, in, um, in sandstones and is very tightly linked uh, to deformation bands. So Ideen and Johnson, the same Ideen that I mentioned earlier, um, they published this paper from which this diagram is on on the right, where they proposed that in porous sandstones, um, the way that faults develop, we develop single deformation bands, which then tend to form clusters. Um, and due to strain hardening, it's easier to make new bands than to reactivate old ones. So they tend to cluster. And then once that cluster is big enough and brittle enough, uh, a slip surface breaks through and you have a fault. So there is a precursor stage of deformation band formation and clustering and then transition to discrete slip. 
This also was also supported by Antonellini et al. in 1994, um, who found evidence for that, you know, um, slip surface formation marks the transition from cataclastic flow to localized slip, and there is not a significant amount of additional appreciable cataclases after that localized slip has been established. Shipton and Cowie in 2001 um, continued developing this model. Um, and they suggested that, you know, once slip surfaces develop, they have developed in patches, and then they um, amalgamate and become like a through going slip surface later on. So rather than the, the Idina Johnson model of, you know, forming a huge cluster and then boom, you have a slip surface, they nuance this view a little bit and say that, well, these slip surfaces can start earlier as patches and then you break through, um, break through uh, an amalgamated slip surface uh, after a while. And, and crucially, this nucleation of patches slip surface could happen relatively early on. And this was also supported by Mayer, who a few er uh, years earlier did her PhD, Karen Mayer, uh, on experimental deformation of sandstones. And in the sort of post-mortem analysis of her experiments, she saw uh, on some of the experiments patches of striated uh, slip surface, slip surfaces in some of the experiments at low strength. So that supports that notion by, by Shipton and Cowley. But this is all in quite homogeneous quartz sandstones. So what about in volcanic plastics? So then we need to take a look at, you know, what, what how volcanic plastics are, you know, different and similar to porous sandstones. So let's first look at the similarities. You know, what's similar between volcanic plastics and a, you know, say a quartz sandstone? Well, they're both porous and granular. Um, volcanic plastics, you know, there is also particular and cataclastic flow is also important in, in volcanic plastics. And deformation bands are, are a common strain localization feature. So that's the commonalities between volcanic plastics and sandstones. But there are also some, you know, key differences. So let's, let's take a look at those. So first of all, dissimilarities. The volcanic plastics have heterogeneous grain properties. They have strong grains and weak grains. So they're not a homogeneous quartz sandstone. They are a material where you have we often have weak grains, often in volcanic class. And you have relatively stronger grains that can be fenacrysts, uh, crystals, basically. And the grains may also have anisotropic mechanical properties. So, for example, pyroxene, amphibole, and feldspars, they have mineralogic weakness planes, so cleavage, and which means that they are weaker in some directions than others. But that's also different to, to, to uh, a sandstone, which consists of quartz. And this, as we shall see, has some implications for, for how they behave when they're deformed. So those shipping tufts in Taiwan that we're going to look at, that was all this you know, background information. So let's just quickly, before we go into the nitty gritty of the structures in Taiwan, just look quickly at what Taiwan is and the study area. Taiwan is sitting here uh, with a Philippine sea plate moving at about eight centimeters a year crashing into the Eurasian plate. And um, Taiwan is sitting right at this sort of triple junction here. And it's got one of the highest uplift rates in the world, one of the highest erosion rates in the world. So it's really like a rock and roll uh, location for, for tectonics. Um, and as you can see in, the, you can see in this um, free diagram here, what the sort of layout of these subduction zones and, and everything is. So our study areas here on the east side of Taiwan, along with what's just east of what's called the longitudinal valley on the sketch. Um, a little bit more about the tectonic history. About 12 million years ago, we had the Luzon Arc, um, which still exists now to the north of northeast of Taiwan as a volcanic arc. Um, this was at this time sitting outboard and east of Taiwan. Uh, but then it crashed into Taiwan, and about five million years ago, that collision sort of initiated with an arc 
the, with the Luzon Arc colliding with, with the east side of Taiwan. And this is sort of pictured today with that, that crashed um, island arc smeared onto to eastern Taiwan. So that's where the, these um, tufts, these volcanic plastics that we're looking at is coming is, you know, they're, they're from this Luzon Arc that has crashed onto eastern Taiwan. And this is what it looks like here. These are the volcanic plastic deposits. This is the coastal range, which is essentially this crashed um, volcanic arc, coastal range, which is where we're working in a little village called Shititing. Um, <clears throat> and these are the rocks that we're looking at, quite spectacular. This is outcrop is called uh, the Cuesta. And you can see this volcanic stratigraphy, this volcanic plastic stratigraphy here that we're working in and, and looking at faults and, and um, deformation values. So uh, I thought I'd show you guys, let's see if this works. I have a little drone video here. Oh yeah, it's working. So uh, essentially we've uh, mapped out, you know, structures using drone images and of course working on the ground, uh, doing sampling and microstructural analysis uh, and so on. But this gives you kind of an overview. This is the Shitiping village. And the outcrops that we're working at are these beachfront outcrops of layered volcanic plastics of the Tuluanshan formation, late Miocene um, volcanic plastic rocks of this accreted volcanic island arc. Um, that we see here in, in, in Eastern Taiwan. It's a great place to work, um, really fantastically exposed and, you know, great infrastructure and super friendly people. And here's just one more little drone video, um, just showing, it will show you how <clears throat> these are just islands just offshore, which you know, flying with a drone makes us able to get the overall sort of structural picture. You can see here, this is the bedding going like this, and you can see these structures that go across the bedding. Those are faults and deformation bands. And now the camera will turn down and you can see here that faults and deformation bands cutting across the bedding. So, so let's take a look at um, a bit of detail here. Uh, from the faults and deformation bands and the shifting tufts. The structure types that we're looking at here are um, three kinds of deformation bands, and then we have the faults. So we have pure compaction bands, we have reverse sense compactional shear bands, and then we have strike slip compactional shear bands, and uh, which are you know closely related to the strike slip faults. They're essentially the same in terms of orientation and development, but these are more uh, for the develop. So these have meter scale offsets. So let's take a look at those. Pure compaction bands, uh, quite simple structures. Um, you can see here the bands have an orientation like this and they're very much confined to specific layers. And you can see here the bedding, they're cutting across some bedding in terms of the layer, but they're very much confined to this layer. And um, we can see here in this um, picture on the right, uh, this SEM picture on the right, you can sort of, well, it's kind of hard to make, maybe see with the naked eye, but um, when you measure it, there is a slight reduction of porosity from the host rock into the band, but there is no observable grain crushing, um, uh, or nor is there any shear offset. So the only kinematic effect on these bands is pure compaction. So essentially these bands form normal to the main axis of principal stress sigma one um, and are kind of like the deformation band uh, equivalent to stylolites. And then we have the second type of deformation band that we see here, which are called reverse, which we call reverse sense compaction or shear bands. So it's a deformation band that is sort of layer parallel and then it ramps up like a sort of a ramp flat ramp type fault structure. You can see the bands here and you can see the interpretation on the right here. Um, and those who have a sharp sense of observation will see that you know the scale bar here is on the several centimeters. So the offsets on these individual bands is many centimeters. 
And if you've ever worked on deformation balancing class in, in, in sandstones, in porous sandstones, quartz sandstones, you'll know that you know each individual band will, will often have a shear offset of about a millimeter. This is an order of magnitude greater, which is a first interesting observation. You know, what, why is that? And you can see that there's clear grain size reduction. This is just a, a close up photo. And you can see this is the host rock underneath the band here. And this is inside the band. And you can see that the grains are much smaller inside the band here than they are outside the band. So <clears throat> if we take a look uh, under the microscope, under the SEM, we can see that uh, we can take a look at the microstructure. First of all, you can see. Uh, on, on the left here, there is a line which marks uh, the border of the band to the top and the host rock at the bottom. And in the host rock, you can see this, the black, you know, porosity is, is greater than, than in the band. You can also see these pointy sharp things. They are volcanic glass shards. And those glass shards are absolutely crushed inside the band. So there is a significant degree of grain crushing within these bands. Another very interesting observation here is that we can see that in the minerals, uh, in the crystals, remember I said that, you know, the volcanic plastics, they have glass shards, and they also have crystals of various things. So here are hornblende crystals, and we can see that the cleavage planes in the hornblende are being exploited. So we can see here, for example, um, extension fractures opening along the cleavage planes, which is contributing to the cataclastic deformation of these crystals. So the third type of deformation band that we have here are strike slip compactional shear bands. And, and we can see here quite big offsets. Um, and you can see the hammer for scale here. It's, it's offsets on you know more than 10 centimeters, which is exceptionally huge for deformation bands to compare them to uh, quartz sandstones. Um, interestingly, you can also see that once these bands cross through um, more brittle types of, uh, of rocks, um, we can see that they transition into shear fractures like this. Um, and let's take a little bit of a look at the microstructure here as well. We can see uh, a couple of interesting things here. We can see um, glass, which is damaged on the side of the band. We see grain size reduction within the band here. And down here on this image, we can see this is the edge of a band here touching a hornblende crystal. And you can see that on the left side of the hornblende, this is starting to be incorporated into the band by kind of like shaving off uh, crushing the home land along the cleavage planes. So very interesting, this role of the cleavage planes in the home land. <clears throat> and then we can see here, uh, we also see an effect of pumice smearing. We can see this pumice class is smeared along the band. So that's, that's kind of interesting as well. And again, we can see how cleavage planes, they're breaking up along cleavage planes and and we can envision how this is um, incorporating or sort of how this is contributing to the disintegration of the grains and their incorporation into the to the bands. Right. <clears throat> so that was the small scale structure. So let's look at the at the overall falls because we do have these are deformation bands. Um, and if we look at the faults, we can see now structures that have this structure here is um, orientated about northeast, north, north uh, east, northeast, west, southwest. And we can see there's a, a pretty large structure. And here's a scale here, it's about 75 meters. So it's on the order of a couple of hundred meters, the structure as, um, that we can follow along about 200 meters of its length. And um, what we can see here is that the fault is comprised, it's a fault zone comprised of slip surfaces and a damage zone of deformation bands, sinistral and dextral strike slip deformation bands. And if we look on the right here, we can see um, we've recorded within this segment here, within this red frame, we recorded displacement, which we can see is highly variable. 
and up to about two and a half meters. Um, <clears throat> and we can also see that the width of the zone is quite variable depending on it's running through different volcanic layers. You can see that the width of the deformation zone is going up and down. Also, the number of strands, uh, the slip surface strands across the fault zone is also highly variable. Now, you can see over here, you can see a structural sketch of this zone here of the fault zone. And we've divided the fault zone into three main segments. One segment over here, then the next segment is segment two over here, and then a step left again to this segment over here. And it's separated by these kind of like, well, relays or areas of, of, of overlap. And we can see here um, also we've used these topological methods to, to just show um, the intensity of structural intersections, which is basically topological nodes. So these structural intersections, this color maps is basically telling us where the warm colors are, there is lots of intersections between different structures. You can basically see that in these areas of of high connection of uh, where segment one and segment two is connecting, there is a lot of clustering, and also where segment two and three are connecting. But also here in the middle, where we have the maximum displacement, we see high number of uh, connections. So what does this fault zone look like? Well, it's basically peppered with deformation bands, and uh, but it's also highly variable. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the macroscopic structure of the fault. I'm going to go into the uh, a bit more on the microstructure because what we're interested in is how does slip localize and um, what are the mechanisms on the micro scale for localizing slip. But this is basically the, the larger scale architecture. We have these slip surfaces and we have the bands around them in the damage zone. Now, if we take a look at this uh, fault right next to it, it's another fault with a slightly smaller displacement, about one meter. Um, we can see here, uh, if we take a look at this, the core of the fault right here and the sketch of, um, of the, um, the sort of structural interpretation of it, having looked at it very closely, we can see that it's riddled with these SC structures, this SC fabric. Um, we have the C planes running along here, and we have these S planes running diagonally. And we'll take a closer look at this on the next slide. We're looking here at a, you know, a part of one of the faults, which is full of deformation bands. And we can maybe sort of, you know, from looking at this, maybe we can get the idea that there is, you know, some fabric on this way and there is something diagonally going between them. But let's take a closer look. If we take uh, a look at this right here and take a pin section, what we can see here is this um, orientation that goes right across. And then we can, can get at this orientation that goes diagonally between this gray sort of layers, if you like. If I put on some interpretation here, this is what it looks like. We have the C planes going right across and we have the S planes um, in between. So that's quite unusual for deformation bands. And I don't know of many examples of uh, SC structures being reported in deformation bands. I do know of at least one, which I'll refer to later on. Um, we can take a look at some of these. Um, we can take a look at some of this in even more detail here. Let's look at these one and two here. Let's see what's going on within these S planes. And we can see inside the S planes, we can see that they're kind of defined by crushed crystals, which is interesting, uh, alternating with, with layers of, with, with um, uh, alternating with, with more glassy uh, zones. And again, here we can see another example, uh, this other image number two, we can see this S fabric here defined by a partly crushed uh, crystal. And we can see how it's opening along um, these extension fractures, which is helped by the cleavage. So some key observations from this. On individual deformation bands, we saw up to tens of centimeters of displacement, which is in contrast to deformation bands in sandstone, where you know, displacement is generally much more minor. On the faults, um, the microscopic slip on the faults occurred without major clustering. Okay. 
So essentially, this kind of contrasts the models for false formation in sandstone, where you have this stage of white clustering and then you know something breaks through. We had the observation of SC fabric being present within the fault core and on the micro scale, which is uncommon in deformation bands. And then we saw these mechanical weakness, uh, the mechanical weakness present here. We have this weak glass that basically shatters, and we have mechanical anisotropy of the crystal, and that also contrasts the material properties in sandstone. So these are some of the key observations that we uh, took away. And um, then let's try and, and discuss some of those observations and try and understand what they mean. And we'll do that by, by taking a look at a couple of other relatively recent papers. Um, this paper by Melanie Finch et al. Um, is a very neat paper with uh, some pretty cool um, animations. Uh, and they're using numerical simulations to look at the evolution of SC fabric. And, and quite particularly, they were interested in the C prime fabrics, but they also show very nicely the whole sort of SC fabric uh, developments. I'll show you one of those animations right here. And what you can see, we can already see this diagonal fabric developing, which is the S fabric. Um, and which is oriented like this. And then now you can see, start to see some of this fabric going horizontally across the screen, which is the C fabric. And I'll take that, I'll run that once more so that you can see it. Start looking for the S fabric that forms first. And, um, and then afterwards, the C fabric starts forming. So the S fabric is, will form diagonally across the screen. And then the C fabric will then start to form horizontally across the screen. Oops. So we can see here already we get this diagonal orientation of the S fabric. And now we're, we can start seeing this C fabric developing as well. So that's quite cool. And um, one of their findings uh, is that, you know, for this type of fabric to develop, you need to have a weak phase present. So basically, you need to have something that's weaker than something else for this type of fabric to develop. And that corresponds pretty well with the material properties of volcanic clastic rocks. We think the work of Finch et al is saying something clever about that we can use to understand why we get SC fabrics developing in these types of rocks, but not in the much more homogeneous quartz sandstones. Probably because we have this weak phase present, which is facilitating the development of SC fabric. So, Another related problem is, you know, this slip surface development. You know, why do we have um, why do we have such large slip accumulating on these deformation bands? At seemingly at an early stage, we get tens of centimeters of slip on individual bands, which is not common in other types of deformation bands in quartz sandstones. And we hypothesize that this has to do with these. Um, both with a mineralogic weakness point, the cleavage, but also the also again the fact that you have a weak phase. And this is supported by this paper, um, the Nikio et al. paper from uh, 2018, who's looked at foliation development of deformation bands in, in arcosic conglomerates and sandstones in Brazil. And they conclude that the weak phase is key to early slip surface development and SC fabric formation through preferential crushing of, of, that, uh, of that weak phase. So then there is, you know, how do we explain this, this weakening um, or, or, or this cataclastic uh, behavior in, this, in these rocks? Well, we know that glass is weak. You know, there are many people have measured the strength of volcanic glass, and it's not very impressive. It's very weak, crushes very easily. We also know that grain angularity, or, and, you, and you saw the image that I showed, you know, the glass charts are just very pointy and angular. Grain angularity promotes cataclysmic deformation. That's shown experimentally by Meritel in 2002. We also know that high porosity, which characterizes these rocks, may 
produce lower critical yeast yield strength. So that's that's been shown by other people. So um, all of this and the presence of, of, of these weak phases promote cataclysis and it also probably promotes early slip surface formation. Um, but the role of the grain anisotropy, the cleavage being present, the cleavage planes are inherently weak. And they have been shown by other people to control cataclysis in experimentally derived calcite dolomite gouges. So de et al. showed that in 2019 um, using these experiments. And we think that applies here as well. The cleavage planes control cataclysis. And also, Nikio et al. that I just mentioned suggested that the cleavage planes of feldspars were suggested to control the cataclysis in the Arcosi sandstone. So that, that cleavage plays a role as well. So what are the sort of key takeaway points here? Well, I think they are, <clears throat> let's, let's take a look at this, is, you know, beautiful sketch by my colleague, uh, Thibault. Um, you know, we saw this fabric that we have in the core and on the micro scale, we have these C planes and the S planes here in the compressional quadrant. Um, and, you know, how does that all develop? You know, how does the slip localize? And Hana Yavidalo uh, was a master student. Uh, <clears throat> she drew up a model of, of how, um, how these crystals basically preferentially crush and attract, almost attract the slip surface, kind of like form like a nucleation point for the slip surface development, um, according to her, um, her, her, that was what she was hypothesizing. So we, we suggest that two, we two effects work together here. First of all, these mineralogic weakness planes, cleavage may act as localization sort of locus points and the weak phase the glass also promotes an early and rapid slip surface development and, and amalgamation. And the result is that instead of the bands being strain hardened, which is you know common thing in, in sandstones, the bands here are effectively strain weakened. Um, they may accumulate greater slip, and we see an earlier transitioning from cataclastic flow to discrete slip. That's that's what we suggest. Based on the observation, the microstructural, the microstructural observations of the effects of mineralogic weakness planes and the, and the glass, and on the fact that we see such large uh, displacement on individual structures is strongly indicative that they're strain weakened and not strain hardened. Which means that we have in these rocks an earlier transition from cataclastic flow to discrete slip and that they may, that may, that they may accumulate greater slip and are effectively strain weakened. So the implications of this is that the models developed for fault formation in porous rocks are developed in sandstones. They're not very applicable here um, with a long period of strain hardening and ultimately, ultimately slip surface formation. That's not very suitable here. There are other things at play, as I was getting at, you know, with, with the weak phase and, um, and the mechanical anisotropy um, introduced by the cleavage planes. And also strain hardening appears to be less important here. So what are the next steps for us to do? Um, so near, near future and ongoing work, we're doing EBSD analysis to investigate the preferential mineralogical orientation within and near the bands to investigate the role of the weakness planes. And we want to do experimental deformation of the tufts, which would probably require us to uh, write a new project proposal and get some funding to do that. There was also an ongoing PhD project at the University of Bordeaux, with, of Bordeaux which uh, Thibault, uh, Thibault is uh, supervising. Uh, it's a student called Etienne Leroy. And looking at deformation in glassy tufts without um, crystals in Greece. So here in, 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 in that setting, you have the glass, but, but you don't have those phenocrysts with the weakness planes. And the preliminary finds suggest that in this setting, slip surface development is uncommon, which is again pointing us to the fact that these crystals with these mineralogical weakness planes in, term, in, 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 in the form of, of cleavage planes are absolutely 
critical to understand how this is working. You have one field area in Taiwan where you have these present and you have slip surfaces everywhere. You have another field area in Greece where there are none of these crystals and it's more or less exclusive of glass and you don't get slip surface development. So that's just wildly interesting and um, something that for, for Etienne to explore. Right, I think that was um, that was my presentation. I, it's now um, four minutes to two, so I guess that's pretty good timing, is it? Um, yeah, you are just on time. Thank you very much, Atle. Yeah, it was and really uh, apologies for apologies for botching up uh, the topic. No, 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 my apologies. I was mistaken. <laughs> it was interesting, <laughs> absolutely, very much interesting. Uh, I'm opening the podium for questions. I am pretty much sure that there will be people interesting interested to to, answer, to ask questions. So I don't see any all of you on the uh, Zoom. So whoever is in the Zoom, just pop in. And okay, yeah, I, I, I knew, I knew, I knew it that you were going to ask a question. So it's okay. <laughs> Right. Um, so go, go ahead and I leave I let the students to be next. <laughs> but before before just say uh, hi Ali uh, good to see you. Hi. So um yeah, I can't. I can't really. I can't really hear you, actually. Oh goodness! Um, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. No, okay. It's okay. Sorry. Yeah, I wasn't directing my voice at the computer. Um, well, first, thank you. Very, very, very interesting talk. Uh, particularly interesting looking at uh, the geology of Taiwan, and and um, yeah, this is an interesting uh, parallel to sandstone. I guess my question is that original question though about sandstone. Um, how? Uh, like how how close of an analog do you think the volcanic layering is to what is understood from sandstone, from what you can see? I think uh, you know there are like I was getting at with that, that sort of list of you know similarities and differences. I think there are aspects that are similar. You know that they're granular, they're porous, different. You know cataclastic and particulate flow appears to be important, and deformation balance appears to be forming in both types of rocks. So I think that you know some of the same physical principles and mechanisms of deformation appear to to be you know comparable. But um, so in that sense, you know it's partly applicable. But uh, I think you need um, you need to have you know strong caution because the material is very different. You know, a homogeneous. Uh, quartz sandstone with well-rounded grains is extremely different from a material where you have, you know, weak, very pointy glass shards and, and these crystals with, with cleavage. So, yeah, there are similarities and differences. Yeah. And if I could just one other real quick question. Um, with the uh, volcanic, um, with the, with, with those layers, what is, what is the, I mean, I'd realize, what is the age more or less of, of those eruptions that you're, you're looking at? They're about five five million years old. So, um, so the rocks are about five million years old, and you know, just, they're a mixture of subaerial and submarine eruption. Some of it has been reworked. Actually, most of it has been reworked a little bit. So, um, yeah, that's the material. Okay, and constantly uplifting, essentially, right? I, I mean, most of it's an uplifting. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I I will uh, continue follow. Can you hear me? Go ahead. I can hear you very well. Yeah, it's just that the phone, the microphone is very directional for this. Um, so again, like I said, uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, what do you think is the the effect of uh, well, that there are two questions that are sort of combined. One of them is is what's the association of the deformation to the the position of those uh, of those elements? Are those two completely separate events or are they somehow related? And maybe a related question is, is what's the role of confining pressure 
on uh, allowing segmentation and, uh, and forming the, this type of, uh, of deformation. Right. Um, so to the first question, um, you, could, you could wonder when you come and see this, is this sin volcanic deformation? But it's, it's uh, uh, the, what the evidence suggests is, I didn't show that now, but we've basically systematically measured all the structures and they fit perfectly with a tectonic, uh, well, basically with a plate motion. So it's, uh, their deformation is arguably and you know, evidently uh, related to the convergence of the Philippine sea plate against, you know, the, the Chinese mainland, basically. So, so it's tectonic. It's not, uh, it's not sin volcanic deformation, but you, you often see, you know, you often see these uh, deformation bands, uh, you, you can see, they can form sin volcanic as well, but, but based on their orientation and relationship to the, to the present and historic um, convergence, it's, it's completely, it's completely and perfectly uh, consistent with, with that. Um, I think we, sh we, we show that in this paper that I cited a couple of times, Kavais and, and Wutavatam in, in 2018, if you're interested in that. Um, what is the role of confining pressure? Um, in, well, there are different things to say about that. So the depth and the exhumation of, um, of these rocks progressively throughout the deformation history gives an interesting result so um so essentially um so essentially what one thing that we see is that there appears to be a shift um or, uh, there, there appears to be a shift uh, at some point from um from deformation uh, accommodated by reverse sense deformation to strike slip deformation which, which is suggesting uh, a burial related flip of the um, of sigma one, sigma two. So basically, these are obviously at the surface when they're being erupted, and then they're basically, you know, buried and then they're exhumed again during the um, during the during the collision uh, or after the collision uh, and uplifted. So, so, <clears throat> so that confining pressure is controlling, uh, or that uh, that burial is confining whether the you know the horizontal stress, the balance between the horizontal stress. And the vertical burial stress appears to be, you know, quite close, and that at some point it's flipping. So you start you you're going from um, from basically, if you look, you know, if you look at the principal axis stress orientations according to Andersonian faulting, um, and you see that it flips from reverse sense deformation to strike slip deformation. So that's quite interesting. Um, now I'm not sure if I answered your question. It's but... it's always. You know, within the short time frame from the position to full exhumation, it couldn't have gone very deep. So no. through the process, we're talking about about near surface uh, processes. We're not talking about deep processes. The, the the maximum burial depth of these rocks is estimated to about fifteen hundred meters. Fifteen hundred meters. Yes. Oh, yeah, so yeah. so the, the confining pressure is not very big. No, no, it's not very big. But uh, that, that's true. And uh, in, I mean, interestingly, I mean, you can have deformation bands forming more or less at the surface if the, if the, if the grains are pretty weak. You know, if you look at um, deformation bands in, um, in bioclastic grain stones, for example, in carbonates, um, if they're, for example, composed of echinoderm fragments, you know, you can crush those fragments between the tips of your fingers. Uh, so basically forming, those can form more or less at the surface and you can envision here that you know at, at quite low confining pressures you can you can achieve uh, grain crushing at um, uh, in these types of rocks as well if the, if the material is sufficiently weak but, but my point is that uh, maybe if you if if all the process was going a uh, much deeper yes near to the where 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 strength is much bigger and and confining pressure is much bigger and where the major earthquakes are happening is it is it happening the same is it are we seeing something that is uh, really representing the situation that's a good question well yeah. i guess the answer is we don't really know um but um and there is also another element coming in here which is you know welding and and if you're welding the rock you know it's not going to be a porous and granular rock anymore and then your main mechanism for deformation is not going to be 
particular than cataclastic flow, then it's going to be discrete slip, uh, yeah, like any other non porous rock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was thinking actually. I was thinking actually that you you have exceptional, very exquisite examples for what you are showing also in outcrops here in Israel. Well, they are not volcanic plastics, but uh, in the Dead Sea, you know. And um, I wonder if uh, one day you could, we could bring you around um, this it's area. Really not to mention the seismics that uh, Isik is dealing with. And, and yeah, the, the, the invitation still stands. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I would love to come. I mean, there's been a pandemic in the meantime, but now things are loosening yes. up. So it's, uh, it's not yeah. possible. But also, but also, Ioannis wants to continue with the paper. We need to. Oh. Fantastic. Well, let's, 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 the, 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 the paper thing, let's leave it for uh, another yeah. more close <laughs> discussion, let's say. Uh, we are still on the questions. So uh, somebody else has a question, perhaps Pasha in the room over there. Mm -hmm. You who? Yeah. I no, we don't have a question, but we enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Nobody had a question. Okay. Somebody else in the audience, just raise the hand or pop in or what? So everything was clear then. Yeah, so, I'm sorry if I uh, if I disappointed anyone who wanted to hear about the digenesis uh, along faults and rifts. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you didn't. You haven't. But in any case, as uh, Itik mentioned, uh, we will find a way to bring you around the, these latitudes, okay? One day that or the other. Good. Thank and, you so much uh, for uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. And, and Atle, would you like to be still in contact with us for the future uh, seminars? I can send you the, the, the announcements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that would be nice. Cool. So you're always invited if it's, uh, if it's uh, suitable for the hour. Thank you. Cool. So everybody, next week we continue with our uh, uh, seminars. Uh, and I think we are moving to Spain. We're still in Europe, <laughs> same Thank time zone. So everybody, see you next week. Thanks guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye.